I want to give a big shout out to the fine people who are supporting the Patreon. Not only are they making this happen, which uh, certainly I feel very supported by that process, uh, but also they've started getting all sorts of great new things. I've been recording extra Patreon exclusives with the guests who've been on. Uh, We've had Jen Zart on talking about some astrological aspects. Uh, We've had Al Cummins talking about geomancy and pizza magic. And uh, we've had the Stacking Skulls crew on talking about their musical influences, both spiritually and ridiculously in their lives. And all of this stuff is only for people who are supporting the Patreon. So please consider it. Think about how many hours of this podcast you've listened to. And jump over to patreon.com slash the hermit's lamp if you pledge five dollars an episode you will get access to all of that good stuff but there are perks at many levels as well thanks for supporting it enjoy the episode welcome to another installment of the hermit's lamp podcast i am here today with austin Kopic, and uh, i know austin from his wonderful chats with Gordon White on Gordon's podcast, where they do uh, a twice a year sort of check in about what's going on astrologically and what's coming down the line. And, uh, you know, it's always very insightful and uh, it sets a nice framework for sort of thinking about the bigger pictures of what's going on. Um, so I have been listening enjoyably to those and thinking that having Austin on here to chat about what happens as we live with astrology and think about astrology and, you know, all that kind of stuff as we go through our lives would be wonderful. But in case people don't know who you are, Austin, why don't you give us a, an introduction here? Okay. Um, I suppose I'll start with my most public face. I am a professional astrologer. I write, um, I, I write about what's happening, what's going to happen in different time frames, ranging from the, the daily to the decadely. Um, I've also been a consulting astrologer full time for the last ten years as well, uh, eleven years, and uh, I also uh, teach a variety of classes about astrology um, and also uh, some about uh, the astrological magic tradition. Mm-hmm. And how did you, I'm curious how you got into astrological magic because I came out of um, sort of Western ceremonial stuff, which I got into as a teenager and spent a long time playing with and working with. And one of the things that was my, my favorite was the sort of planetary work and those kinds of things, you know, and it's actually one of the few pieces that sort of endures from that time as something that I still sort of play with in my, in my life and in my practice. But where did that come from for you? How did you find your way into that? It's a good question. I have a, convoluted but hopefully coherent answer uh (laughs) um so when i got when i first got really into astrology when i was maybe 19 20 it had a lot of paradigmatic implications to me the fact that it worked and it didn't just work in a fun it was more than just the extremely colorful Rorschach test, which I thought it was at first. Mm-hmm. And it does function very well in that regard, right? But it's um, when I started seeing it um, reflecting life and death level events, um, I actually um, predicted some deaths that happened during that time, which is not something I do in my practice now. Maybe, maybe if someone really wants to do that and i think their reasons are good but you know i didn't take it seriously um and so that's a pretty good way to get you to take things seriously to just to throw death in there right (laughs) um and so 
um, that got me, that got, that also made me take seriously the paradigmatic uh, implications of astrology. If, you know, if it's, if it's, you know, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's, if, it's, if astrology could um, say things that serious, then a lot of what I had been taught about the world was either incorrect or woefully incomplete. Mm. And <clears throat> around the, uh, around that same time, um, I, I started, uh, I, I started training with some people who did uh, internal martial arts where, cause I've been doing martial arts for, I don't know, since I was a kid, but um <clears throat> I'd never really experienced anybody who could do anything that made me think that chi was anything more than a metaphor. Mm. Um, but then I started training with a guy who was from a school and then I went to that school and, you know, the teacher could do things that were um, impossible if, you know, if this chi wasn't actually uh, <laughs> describing part of reality. Mm. And so that, that brought, I would say that, that, that played a, uh, that was another piece in changing what I thought was real, right? You know, in a very physical way, you know, getting your ass kicked by um, a rea- by something you can't explain really makes you think about it. Yeah. Um, and so as I, I got, <clears throat> uh, I, I started doing massive amounts of Qigong and meditation and that, um, that it was uh, sort of in the space that that opened up. Um, that's where the magic came through for me, and it came through hard and fast and confusing, as I, I think it does for, for for a certain percentage of practitioners. Sure. Um, and so I, you know, I I, I, I intersected with um, some magical material before. You know, you're back when um, back when people went to bookstores um, <laughs> or like you know you go to the astrology section and write next to it is you know there's crowley right and there's there's modern magic and you know i pop those open and there are tables of astrological correspondences so i was aware of this material because of its proximity to astrology both physically and as an art like literally the books were next to each other right um which is by the way you know a reason to go to bookstores right (laughs) i mean we're like, yeah, I can get it on Amazon, but a good bookstore, like you're going to encounter things that are proximal uh, to, uh, you know, to what you're doing. They may, it may be that what you think you want is actually just, uh, you know, a, a pathway to the thing that's right across from it on the shelf, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, <clears throat> and so, yeah, I jumped into the magic. I, you know, memorized the, you know, Golden Dawn correspondences and I, went crazy with some shadow tarot and Typhonian OTO stuff and spirits, big spirits popped into my life from traditions I'd never had any intersection with, um, which was very, that was, that was the, some of the most confusing. Um, Some of the, you know, some of the the spirits whose names are, um, you know, primarily found in Haitian voodoo and like popped into my life. And I literally had to look up what, these um, tr- uh, awesomely powerful figures were because I didn't even know the names. Uh, uh, I think but- there's some kind of fundamental connection between that sort of thelemic current, right, and and those those African diasporic spirits, right. So I- that's a- not to interrupt your whole life. No, no, no. That's a really interesting. Well, there's the. I'm you know I'm I'm not. Uh, I, I, it would be impossible to characterize me as a Thelemite um, at any point. But, um, you know, if we're talking about the larger Thelemic current, you know, going from Crowley and then to Grant and then uh, working with uh, Linda Florio's, um, I don't know what you can call it, reification of the tunnels. Um, what I found, what I got from that was um, like a, a deep, magical enema (laughs) it like blew open and it opened up all of these channels it made all of these um it created all of these wonderful emptinesses and absences which you need a channel needs to be empty in the middle right Right. um and that allowed that allowed a lot of stuff to come in um and that's funny i don't hear people talking about 
um, that material in terms of um, creating a sort of creating, you know, it's sort of like draining out the nightmares from a tunnel so that there's a, you know, so that that beautiful ad that like beautiful and fecund absence can then, um, uh, you know, things can emerge from that, that more primordial state. Mm-hmm. And part of my experience of that was probably because I was coming from, um, you know, a couple years of intense Taoist practice, right. um, you know, where uh, there's a lot of, there's a, a big focus on returning to the fertile void state or Wu Chi. And right. then you're supposed to do that at the beginning of every Tai Chi form and every, pretty much any internal form. And you're returning to that and then emerging out of it. And so that was, um, you know, that, that, that's, well, it's still a very important space, but anyway, that's what I, that's part of what I got out of that tunnels work. Um, and I was, uh, led by various Loa to make some excellent changes in my life. And when then <clears throat> not too much longer, or, you know, and I experimented with some of the, uh, the sort of golden dawn lodge style planetary magic, um, you know, the, the six and seven stars and the Denning and Phillips planetary magic book. And that was interesting. Um, but it, it didn't, it didn't quite sing. And actually, you know, just funny anecdote, the first, uh, sort of formal, uh, astrological magic operation I did was this, uh, this evocation of the spirit of Jupiter or it's like, a, yeah, it was an evocation of the spirit of Jupiter. And I got this figure that was like this good natured pig headed mayor of, you know, like he was like, I'm the, you know, it's that like, I'm the mayor, you know, like kind of big and jovial. And I was like, pig headed, huh? Like not stubborn, but like literally had a big hog head. Yeah. And, um, only maybe last year I was reading was it, Jeffrey Kotek's dissertation and Jeffrey Kotek's and it's really interesting work. He's looking at astrological texts in Tang era China. And what he's finding are translations of core Hellenistic um, astrologer, astrology texts like Dorotheus, uh, as well as a lot of Persian and, um, uh, in Indian material and it's being kind of received and redescribed and it gets all the way to Japan. Um, all of that, all of that material gets all the way to Japan by the 10th century, which is a very different shape of transmission than what most people have been thinking anyway. So in one of these, te- one of these texts is like how to make a magical image so that this planet, you know, you'll have this planet's favor and it won't fuck you up. And the uh, the Jupiter one is uh, uh, is the uh, involves the hog. Like they in some of those traditions, the the you they see the the animal of Jupiter consistently being the pig. And so these are you know these are these funny things where you just experience something and then you find out you know sometimes years later that oh yeah you know thousands of people saw exactly that when they looked at, you know deeper into Jupiter's sphere. Mm-hmm. But, but uh, anyway, so, you know, I was doing experiments and then um, the <clears throat> uh, someone placed the Picatrix in my hand and said, I think you'll know what to do with this. Sure. And this was um, this was I think this was 2007. And this is when this was before the Warnock Greer translation of the Latin. And <clears throat> it was the 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 the, the first the first volume from Ouroboros press. And that was all that was available then. And so I, I cracked that open and read it and I was like, Oh yes, this is, this is it. Um, and went about experimenting immediately. Well, as soon as the, the next favorable election was (laughs) because the, that current of uh, traditional talismanic astrological magic um, doesn't, I should say uh, it brings all of the sophisticated timing that astrology provides directly to bear on the operation. And it a lot in my experience, it allows for a much, 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 much higher voltage current uh, to, uh, to transform the things in li- the things around one um, than the lodge style approach to planetary magic. 
Yeah, I think it's, I, I've, I've done both at different times. You know, I spent a lot of time in the OTO and, you know, doing a lot of that kind of stuff and, and in the Orem Solace and doing that sort of planetary work within the mm. structure and, and so on. But, you know, it's funny, like the things, a lot of the more formal stuff was fruitful for whatever it was that it was being worked on. But some of the better things that I ever did were works where I was only focused on myself, right? And they were sort of like these internal planetary workings, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so like, I remember one, the, the most significant of which was that I, I spent a year uh, invoking the moon at each of its transitions between the signs and, uh, and doing uh, essentially like a, uh, a communion ceremony with that and internalizing that energy as a way of tr attempting to redress the imbalances that I experienced both through my understanding of my chart, which was fairly limited at that time, but, but also through sort of my, my psychological and emotional imbalances that I was experiencing, you know, and that sort of repeated cyclical work was, was so helpful at shifting those things, you know, and I, I no longer remember where I got the idea from because it's not anything I ever really kind of came across. Um, it was sort of definitely came out of a hybrid of what I was seeing done and and to almost extent the, the depth to which I felt like I needed to work in order to make those shifts, right? So, yeah, I think there's a lot of really oh, fascinating that, things. That makes, um, um, that 100% makes sense to me. And I've, um, I've also sort of, I've, I also sort of ended up doing stuff like that. I still do stuff like that, even though, you know, the, there wasn't a text that suggests that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I think it, I think that, um, that cycle of work or course of work model with a particular planet is, um, you know, that, that is it, that's sort of the slowly sanding down the rough edges of that sphere within you and the way that it manifests in your life. Um, and that in many ways, that's that I would say that that's the foundation. If, of the, of, of, how should we say, being like the archetypal uh, perfect astrological magician mm -hmm. um, is that you, ha you get to know and then and you do your best to perfect all of the spheres within you. Mm -hmm. Now, and that makes, that, that's connected very closely to um, uh, tr uh, some, some traditions of astrology in India. I've um, recently begun studying the Parashara tradition with uh with a teacher with a lineage holding teacher and <clears throat> the way that they address or one of the ways that they address remediation um <clears throat> is you know i don't know you know my mercury sucks so how do i improve that area of my life right yeah. <clears throat> right so well, the <clears throat> one approach to remediation um is basically it's basically a cycle of planetary work um, you know, they'll use a, a deity connected to a planet. Um, and so, you know, you'll do a particular mantra, which is, you know, when you really look at the structure of mantras and how they're used, um, you know, it's a blurry line between prayer, spell, conjuration, and mantra in a lot of cases. Um, but, you know, um, you would, you would do that. You would do your, your work regularly, um, according to the astrological calendar. Like if you're working on your Mercury, you'd work Mercury every, you know, every Wednesday, you know, during a particular planetary hour. Uh, and, you know, for your Mercury, you might use a, you know, a Ganesh mantra, whereas another person might use divine forms associated with each planet. It's not just one for one, but that's very, you know, when, when you look at it from a distance, it's very similar from doing a cycle of work. Yeah. Um, I, 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 have you ever done um, sort of like a planetary prayer or attunement um, every day on the, on the day and hour of the planet for a week or two? Uh, I mean, not so much with that. Uh, you know, I mean, I did uh, Resh, so the four points of the day for a long time, the, the solar adorations. And um, I did, uh, you know, I did a lot of sort of working with and invoking those kinds of things. Uh, but a lot of my other practices that were ongoing were structured purely at the times that were convenient. So I would, I did a year of mantra work and I would just do it at the same time every morning, every day, because that was 
the only time that fit into my lifestyle. So I didn't have the luxury of, or maybe not even the consideration at that point of time of tying it to other forces. Just asking me if I had done a, um, a sort of series of, of works that were tied to a planetary hour, which isn't really something that I had done um, in, in a concrete way. I mean, transitions and stuff like with the moon, whatever time of day it changed signs, I tried my best to be in the temple at that time, but otherwise not so much. But I'm assuming from your question that you have. Oh, yeah. It's, um, <clears throat> it's a not terribly difficult or time intensive way to really get a sense of what the different planetary currents are in an experiential way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and by, you know, essentially kind of sipping from that cup every day, um, you get a sense of both what the planet's essential quality is, as well as how that is changed Uh, modified, obstructed, or supercharged by what's happening now with that planet. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's something I just kind of, I didn't set it as like, um, you know, um, know, we're going to do this every day for a month. It's just something I probably do five to seven times a week. It's just, you know, I just take a, I just, you know, take 15 minutes. They're not big rights, but it's just like hooking in. And because the day itself, you know, that, that's sort of the juice the day itself is running on or the quality uh, of time, uh, inter- which intersects with the day. It's, a, it's an easy, easy and useful course of work. I believe Gordon White actually um, suggests that to, um, uh, to his members in his, on the membership um, sort of group project area. I was happy to see that. Yeah. Well, I think it's so helpful to... Um, to really understand astrology, at least in my experience, to have more experiences of it, right? You know, I mean, so often people come into my shop for a reading or whatever, like I remember reading for this person, giving them some advice and they're like, oh, well, I have, I have this sign, so I could never do that. And I was like, all right, but like, I think there are options, right? But, but people have these notions that they've acquired about what their charts mean or what this and that means. But these practical experiences of it you know, I think they, they hand that the real truth of the ability that we have to shape or modify or soften or ameliorate things to our advantage, as well as in building that understanding about how we interact with what's going on now, both in the world and in the sky. Yeah, totally. I, um, I find myself thinking about mm, uh, working with the energies present, you know, on whatever day as well as uh, those present in my natal chart. I I tend to default to thinking about them in uh, Chinese medical terms, uh, traditional Chinese medical terms, right? You can, with any, um, you know, any, any point on the energy meridians, you can tonify it, right? You can basically boost it. You can, you know, you can strengthen that energy, you can disperse that energy. You can work on circulating it or cleaning it. You know, in a sense, there's like pacify, clarify, and um, stimulate. Mm-hmm. You know, and you might <clears throat> um, you might have a chart where, oh, let's say um, Mercury is playing a really key role. Like, let's say you have Mercury <clears throat> um, in the tenth house. And so, um, you know, what you're going to be, that means that your professional life will demand a lot of mercurial action from you. Uh, I, I, for example, have mercury in the 10th. And so it's my, I always have to put things into words um, Mm. because I speak and write uh, about these topics. Um, And so there are, there's a lot of demand for mercury in my professional life. Right. Now, you can have a situation on chart where a, a particular energy is of pivotal importance, mm-hmm. but you don't necessarily, you weren't necessarily blessed with the, uh, with the abundance and clarity of that energy that you need or that, you know, would be really nice if you had a little bit more of that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that would be an example where you wanted, where you wanted to boost that energy, right? Because, like, mm-hmm. you're like, no, 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 I need more. I, need, I have, like 
12 more pages in this book and it's due, you know, in three days, the draft is due in three, <laughs> three days. Yeah. And so, you know, that would be an example of like, you know, needs more, you know, that's where you'd stimulate or add a bunch more mercury to it. Then you might have, oh, I don't know, you know, a gnarly configuration, um, let's say Saturn um, conjunct, well, let's just say Saturn ruling your seventh house, right? So um, where <clears throat> Saturn is uh, going to speak to the development of romantic matters in your life. And let's say Saturn's in kind of a rough condition and it's, you know, it, it, it's just kind of all Saturn all the time. You know, like even when you're with somebody, you feel, you know, you feel confined or alone. You have a hard time breaking through your own walls, right? There's just too much Saturn. Right. And, and so that would be, you know, that would be a, a point where you'd want to, um, you know, you'd want to calm or sedate Saturn, right? right. And this is actually something I've been thinking about a lot lately, <clears throat> um, partially because I'm teaching um, a class on traditional astrological talismans for the first time. Um, but it, there are other reasons as well. It's just come up um, is that is looking at the structure of conjurations and prayers to the planets, particularly there's a big, there's a difference between praising, you know, praising, exalting, um, and thereby evoking the energy and power of that sphere, like that, that's a, that stimulates it. Um, whereas, you know, if, if you look at, I don't know, for example, some of the Orphic hymns, the Orphic hymn to Mars is a, it really, it's a, it's a don't hurt me, bro prayer. It's not a like, you know, Oh Lord of the battlefield, fill me with, you know, uh, Viking strength, right? It's a like, you, you do all these things and I recognize that. So could you not do that to me? Would that be cool? Exactly. How about Can we you do maybe... that outside the walls of my city or my house or my heart or wherever? Right. right? Oh, yeah. you know, oh, oh, Lord of the Forge, let's beat some uh, swords into plowshares, right? Because you can do that too. That's not maybe your favorite thing, but you can do, let's do that version of it. Yeah. <clears throat> and anyway, I've just been thinking about how, you know, because the, in the, uh, in the past, those are the differences in function of the different uh, planetary calls and conjurations have been less, uh, less distinct for me. And also, you know, in the, the Parashara tradition, the, there's not one God, one planet. Um, well, there kind of is, but there kind of isn't. You would address, um, so I don't know, let's, let's, let's find a, a good example. Okay, let's, uh, <clears throat> for gods that intersect with Mars, right? Let's, mm -hmm. w there's Aries, obviously. Sure. Um, and then, but we could also, we could also look at Ogun, right? Mm -hmm. Ogun is not Mars, um, but Ogun can definitely work through and help you work with martial energy, right? It's important not to conflate them. But <clears throat> if, you know, if we compare the, um, the, the stories and the quality of the Greek Ares, um, with the West African Ogun, there are different elements that are emphasized. Ogun, for example, has um, <clears throat> uh, that has a, a very constructive quality. You know, industrial strength, labor, the ability to heat, beat, and shape the uh, shape the metal and thereby the material world. Right, and sure. uh, the machete not only chops off heads, it also clears the pathway. Right, it clears the forest, and so. <clears throat> If we look at the traditional planetary significations of Mars, Mars is absolutely the, you know, the, 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 the planet uh, where you see blacksmithing and heavy industry and, you know, it's, it's all there. And so yeah. you're going to get a different, um, you know, uh, you're, if you're sort of going through a planet to get to a God and then you're asking a God to go th to shape that planet or help you work with that planet, you know, the different, uh, the different uh, figures that, you know, the, the basically the, the name that you, um, the name that you pick, the God that you see indwelling the planet is going to change the, the nature of the operations result. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Okay. You really want to, you really want to shape it by being clear what you need, right? And what you want, and whether that's more or less or a particular aspect or, Hey, do what you're doing, but don't do it in the house or, you know, whatever. Right. You know, like yeah. I think of, you know, so I, I mean, I have Mars and Aries, right. And I think, Oh, okay. It, uh, you know, number one, it's the gas in the tank. I have a lot of gas in the tank a lot of the times, right. Sometimes I rely on that too much and that doesn't go so well, 
but it's also the thing that had me doing martial arts for a long time and constantly being like more harder faster let's go let's go let's go let's push the limit right and then you know there came this point where i was like no i need less 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 of that 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 is that is not helpful you know and i i remember explicitly i went uh skydiving uh, with a bunch of friends and everybody landed and was like oh my god it's the best thing ever and i landed and my pulse wasn't even going because i was doing so much high adrenaline stuff all the time <laughs> and i was like yeah it was cool whatever and then like a few days later i was like no this has to stop this is not that that energy is too unbridled for whatever reasons and now well, I have to roll that back, right? Well, so generally speaking, a planet that is in its um, in a sign that it rules, like Mars and Aries, um, one it unless it's being interfered with by other planets, it will generally it like that area just works naturally. It's sort of like, oh yeah, you know, like how do you know what do you do when it's go time? Oh, you just go. Right. That's yeah. the Mars and Aries answer. Yeah. Whereas Mars and, you know, Mars and cancer might be like, well, but it's really uncomfortable to go. And I might, you know, like, you know, there, there's the sideways crab walking. Yeah. And so it's great to have a planet in the sign uh, that it rules, but there is the, the danger of excess because that feels so natural and easy. Yeah. Right. Even if it's hard, right. Mars is how we deal with things that are hard and fast, but you're like, Oh no, it's natural and easy to deal with things that are hard and fast. Yeah, for sure. My motto back at that time was, if I'm afraid, I should do it. And right. if I'm really afraid, I should do it now. <laughs> and I was like, that was it. And that was a number of years of my life, right? And well, and that is the life. recipe for maximum adrenaline, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, so it's, it's fascinating. But then it's also this thing where, you know, it's time to turn it down, right? Time to yeah. roll that back into other things, you know? And, and so that was then a process of like shifting that focus and, uh, you know, doing some work and, and yeah, switching more to, to internal martial arts and, oh. and Tai Chi type stuff. And, you know, coincided with my interest in the I Ching and a lot of sort of explorations through that and so on. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, and grab that energy by the horns and like slow it down. And it was very frustrating for a period of time because it did not want to be slow, but, it, but you learn a lot, you know? I had a very similar experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So, go ahead. Oh no, no. I, 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 if I keep going, I'll tangent on martial arts for an hour. So, um, <laughs> well, that, that'll be a separate episode. We'll, we'll talk. We'll have some martial arts talk. Um, so, I think that one of the things that that always interests me about astrology is this sort of uh, this notion of um, it can explain everything in a certain way, like that's definitely sort of a sense of it, right? There's, there are the patterns, there are the pieces, there's what's going on. But, you know, I, I hit this point in my own astrology studies where I, I felt like I had to choose between continuing to proceed full on into tarot stuff, which, you know, I felt like the, you know, kind of my superpower area mm -hmm. and the level of study that I would need to, to kind of continue to understand these complexities in that. And the one thing that I found though, kind of over time is that there were things that emerged that I started looking at that were never what I really would have expected. Um, you know, like I, I, I find the indirects in my chart in super instructive, you know, and whether that's just my chart or whether that's the nature of them or, you know, like those kinds of things. But I'm curious, like what are, you know, people know what their sun and their moon and whatever are probably, right? But like, what are, what are some of the other ideas or other things that you look at that are maybe not, um, you know, a first, a first glance, uh, you know, from reading a book on it kind of idea? You know, what are the, the, the placements or the, the angles or what are things that sort of stand out to you as, as things that seem significant? Well, I mean, that's a big question, for right. starting with sun, moon, and rising sign. Um, and if it's too big a question, there are you know, two I, I, like I, a... I think I can chunk it down. Um, yeah. So two things. One, <clears throat> um, so, you know, the, the very basics of astrology are uh, the positions of all the planets in the zodiac and uh, those positions in the houses. Um, so that's 
actually quite a bit right there. And then the relationship between the significant angles or relationships between those planets, the aspects and their meaning. And then uh, a lot of people after some study will get that far. But the one thing that's been underemphasized before the semi-recent traditional revival is the role of um, essential dignity in a chart, which is, um, you know, when, what is the difference between a, a planet and a sign that rules versus a sign where it's exalted versus detriment? What is triplicity, dignity, and all these things? Um, and that gives you a whole, uh, that gives you a tremendous amount of depth, and it also allows you to gauge um, not just the type of result. And we could say, oh, you know, Mars rules the seventh house of relationship. And so we will see, you know, that person will tend to be in fiery and passionate affairs. They, they don't want to get bored. They don't mind a little adrenaline in the bedroom. But is it, there are much, there are much more functional and much less, less functional versions of that. And that's some, that's, um, you know, judging not just type of event, but quality of event. You know, you could have something that was fast and violent, but very favorable. And of course, you can have things that are fast and violent and extremely unfavorable. And so essential dignity is, plays a very important role in being able to predict that appropriately. Um, a lot of people are aware to some degree of transits, um, which is, of course, the relationship of where the planets are now to where they are in your natal chart. And that's um, a widely used uh, prognostic technique. Um, but one of the, and that's, that's you know, the 20th century's uh, m made good use of and developed that particular technique. But one of the things that is an absolute staple in any, um, you know, sort of pre-18th century astrology going back a solid 2,000 years are um, what could be classed as a, a whole um, Time Lord techniques. And okay. so... Uh, time Lord techniques basically will give you periods of your life that are ruled by a particular planet. And so, um, you know, for example, there's the, the largest scale one is called zodiacal releasing, which is from the uh, second century work of an astrologer named Vedius Valens and Vivi. And so in zodiacal releasing, you'll have these big chapters of your life, which last between eight and 30 years. And they're, um, you know, they're ruled by a particular planet. And so this gives you a tool for looking at biographies and like, you know, the, what does it mean to come to the end of a 15 year chapter of your life? It's a huge thing, right? And so the idea though, let's say, you know, Mars is a 15 year chapter. And so, <clears throat> the idea isn't just that, yeah, it's Marsy. It's that's the time period where all of the significations and meanings of your natal Mars will become obvious and enfleshed in, in your life. Um, the, time Lord, the Time Lord techniques are, um, they're basically, uh, <clears throat> well, the metaphor I usually use is uh, they're, they're the, they're the timing mechanism by which the latent becomes apparent in a person's life with any given planetary position. They're an internal clock like puberty, right? right. It's, it's, you know, it's getting, it's growing uh, hair in new places time. That's just what time it is. And that can be, um, that can be favorable. It can be unfavorable. The environment can facilitate that. The environment can impede that but it's that time. And so um, Time Lord Techniques as a whole give you that, that clock for when you'll see that, um, that, part of a person's, uh, that part of a person's life unfold, right? Because you can look at your chart and you can find all of those spheres within you uh, at any given time, but they're, they're, it's not, excuse me, they're not, characterizing the theater of life and what's actually happening equally all the time. It's sort of whose turn is it? And so that's, um, that provides a whole perspective, a whole different perspective on a chart in life. And I would say is essential to making even reasonably accurate or is essential to make, making consistently um, accurate predictions about what a time period will be like for someone.
Well, it's fascinating because, you know, we all have, I mean, we all have these pieces, right? But when are they, when are they active and what does that mean? And what does it mean to have something that's active later in life than earlier or, you know, whatever, right? Because they're not, they're not tied to, if I understand you correctly, they're not tied to the exactly the same way that say like everybody's Saturn return is at, you know, roughly the same time. They're tied to different patterns, right? For exactly. Exactly. And so hence why somebody peaks early or peaks late or overcomes obstacles at some point or, you know, those things. Is yeah. Or, courage, right? or they, you know, they wake up one day and they're like, you know, I feel like, you know, this, I'm just sort of, you know, and I got, um, you know, if you do consulting work, so when you get consulting work, sometimes you'll, somebody will be like, yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I'm doing this and it's fine, but I just feel like I'm going somewhere else and I don't know what it is. And <clears throat> consistently, um, somebody, you know, somebody will come to me with that and it's like, well, yeah, you're moving out of a 27 year period into a 30 year period. Of course, it's going to be kind of disorienting. Like people can feel those shifts and that's part of learning astrology and appreciating astrology is see, like seeing that like, oh, that's, this person doesn't know this obscure Roman ast- astrological <laughs> technique, sure. but they're, what they're telling me is exactly what this says. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, when, when you have perfect matches like that, you can be like, well, you know, this technique says exactly that about your life. And we can talk a little bit about, you know, we can contrast the nature of where you're coming from and where you're going to and help you see it more clearly. But there's also, there's something, um, there's something grounding in finding out that it's not just all in your head. If a stranger can do math on your the position of the planets in your birth chart and figure out that you would be in this place, you're you know you'd be in this place emotionally at this time, then it must not just be an eccentricity. You're 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 responding to something deeper, you know, um, mm-hmm. the deep weave of the fabric of your own life. Yeah, well, I, I think it, I, I personally love it when people are. Uh, experiencing that even if they don't have the words for it right because then when you can bring it up with them you know whether it's what you're you're talking about or like i did a reading for somebody recently and uh central card was was the hierophant in their reading and about halfway through the reading they're like so i'm just going to tell you now i didn't want to tell you earlier but like this card's been coming up for like the last year all the time and like and we had this big conversation about it and i was like oh perfect which goes with what I was telling them in the beginning, which they were arguing with me about, which was you actually already know everything that's going on here and exactly what you need to be doing. But let's talk it, let's talk it through and talk about why you're not owning that, you know? And Mm -hmm. so like having those moments where you can uh, pinpoint something like that and hand that back to a person is so empowering, right? Because then it takes us back to this place where back to our earlier part of this conversation, really where, we're experiencing these things. And if we are attentive, if we have space in ourselves and our lives where we can feel those things or or be mindful of them, then we can do something with them. And even if we don't know what what to do with them, we can go and find someone who can help us do something with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, uh, I think an important part of astrology is, really paying attention to the quality of different time periods and realizing that, you know, time is as dramatic a landscape as space Mm -hmm. and that, you know, there, um, you know, there, there are times that are hot and dry and there are those that are cold and wet and there, you know, there are those that are abundant and full of life, you know, they're, they're different landscapes. And, you know, if you bring the desert protocol to the meadow, um, you're going to be out of sync, right? And if you bring the meadow protocol to the desert, you're going to be very unhappy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that, you know, well, I wonder, um, you know, who are people who are more living closely with the cycles of nature and cycles of things? You know, these things make a lot of sense, right? I, you know, I mean, I, I had the good pleasure of doing ceremony on the same piece of land every month for two years, right? And, you know, the cycle of, you know, 
there were those times we were standing there and there was like a foot of snow and it was blizzarding and I was looking at this tree and doing the ceremony. And there was those times where it was like, you know, uh, so hot, you know, like 35 degrees Celsius and sunny and clear and standing there and looking at those tree and, you know, and, and, and being in those spaces through all, through all cycles, I think really can uh, cue us into those, those planetary changes too, and the way in which the same thing is different at different times, you know, which we sort of have this sort oh, of false yeah. continuity of things, which they continue, but they're different, right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I, I like, would you say the same, the same space is different at different times or the same place? Yeah. I like, I think that's a really nice way to put it. Yeah. And the seasons are the, you know, the place to start with that for that realization. Um, and then that, you know, that, that is a, a that is most certainly a rat, a rabbit hole because <laughs> it goes beyond the seasons. Um, but that's like that, but just living with the seasons teaches you that that is true that the same place is different at different times. And then once, you know, once you recognize that that is the quality, then you can follow that to more subtle levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also love it when, you know, when there are options to, to see the planets themselves and so on. I remember I was um, maybe 15 years ago or so, Back when Mars was sort of the closest it'll be for a long time, at that sort of zenith of that arc. Um, yeah. And uh, I remember the balcony from my house, we could see it going across the sky, you know? And we would just go out there and turn off all the lights in the house and watch Mars move and watch the moon move across the sky and the various other things. And, you know, it's such, a, such an amazing to be able to sort of sit and connect with those things, you know? the light, the visible light of the planets is important. And that's another, that's a, another piece that uh, astrologers have done a really good job recovering over the last 20 years um, is making, is reminding astrologers that the, a chart with 12 signs and 12 houses is a very use in glyphs is a very useful thing, but that it, that is, um, and abs that is a way of looking at the sky. It's sort of like a decoder ring, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the sky is primary, right? That is the fundamental and primordial thing. And then we mm -hmm. can do things with it. Um, and especially if you're doing, you know, especially if you're doing any sort of energetic or magical work with the planets, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, much more useful to be able to see them and feel them. I mean, who hasn't looked up at a full moon and been like, whoa, just gotten a little blast from that. Yep. Not just cognitively, but like energetically, you're like, oh, okay, yeah. that is, that is strong drink, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just like that, you know, you see the, um, you know, it's on the horizon there. It's, you know, when the moon's coming up over the horizon and it's huge and you don't expect it to be that size, you know, or the colors are different or all these things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, um, yeah. And you, that's, uh, that is in a sense, the root of astrology, but sometimes, you know, when a tree grows tall enough, the little flowers don't, um, haven't had a chance to meet the root or don't realize what's feeding them. And so one of its interesting astrology over a lot, almost in an almost perfectly parallel way to magic has um, benefited immensely from uh, a surfeit of translations of older works. Um, you know, we've, we've, you know, we have, you know, most of the 2100 or so years of the astrological tradition, uh, in textual form and available now for the first time in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And so, it, and that's a, a profound depth of history, right? You know, like people, people come to tarot and be like, Oh, it's from wherever. I'm like, eh, it's not that old, but astrology is that old. Right. Well, and yeah, and <clears throat> that is to that 2100 year old figure. That is the age of, the pretty much exactly the same system that people are using in the 20th century. People in the 20th century are missing some pieces, um, you know, because uh, 
things don't necessarily move in an evolutionary manner, right? <laughs> it's not better every year. It's, sure. uh, tra- you know, things get lost in transmission, things get added, things get lost again. But um, that core signs, houses, planets, aspects, angles, all that stuff is there 2,100 years ago. Um, and, you know, um, a magical and uh, prognostic relationship to the sky of course, has to predate that immensely. You know, well, if, if we're going to follow that, we're, we're going to end up at a time depth um, that is so far beyond written documentation. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, astrology has benefited immensely from recovering its own history, um, which can, which, you know, and sometimes, and you've probably seen this in Magic Land, where people recover a piece of history, they're like, oh, well, you have to do it like the Higramantia. Everything you're doing in a Golden Dawn style, you know, lodge is incorrect because this older thing says something different, right? There's that sort of cranky traditionalist uh, approach. Um, And we get, we have, we certainly have some of that in astrology, but, um, you know, as long as we can avoid that excess, it helps. um, Not only does it give us access to quite literally the ancestor or the wisdom of our ancestors in a tradition, but it can also contextualize um, new developments, right? You're like, oh, I'm, I, I think this is this other technique is, you know, I, I came up with this new technique. Well, you know, now you have a context for that. And you can see examples using the same logic from different traditions. Um, and so you properly, properly rated, you know, the, the tomb is uh, fertile soil for new life. Yeah, if you approach that stuff with curiosity, you know, as opposed to like with the fervor of fanaticism or the dismissiveness of what you're doing, then what, what can be fruitful will really emerge, right? And yeah. Can, oh, yeah. Well, you know what? Let's bring back this piece. Let's try this for some time and see what happens, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, reconstruction is always uh, inherently experimental, I think. Mm-hmm. It can be approached with dogmatic fervor, but you don't know what's going to happen when you perfect the reconstruction. You can hope that it'll be a a better version of the thing that you're already doing, but you literally don't know because you've never done it. You know, you've never, um, one of the metaphors Gordon White likes to use for uh, some elements of magic is that it's, you know, it's like plans to build an alien spaceship. You know, it's alien technology and the instructions for how to build the ship are in the book but you won't know what it's like to fly that thing or what it's really going to do until you, until you put it back together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, astrology is, um, I, I would say, <laughs> especially from our point of view uh, in the contemporary West, uh, very much alien technology. It implies uh, an entire worldview and way of thinking and mechanics that are um, alien. Yeah, I think it, it's interesting. So my, one of my biggest uh, magical focuses um, recently has been uh, centered around uh, leaving the earth as, as sort of a notion, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and coinciding with that, I've been uh, collecting meteorites and working with meteorites as a sort of uh, energetic connection to this sort of interstellar traveler, right? Mm-hmm. And that, that idea of uh, I need to go somewhere else. I need to be somewhere bigger is the notion that I often come back to. Um, but it's exactly that. I have no idea what exactly that means, right? And I mm-hmm. don't really know what that technology is going to be like in action. And as I've been doing it over the last sort of six or eight months and working with these things, I'm noticing the changes and some of them are not at all what I would have expected, right? Um, right. You know, and and you know, obviously I'm not actually leaving the earth or, you know, so on, but, but I'm trying to use this as a, a metaphor and a model for changing consciousness. And, uh, you know, it really, it's fascinating how that uh, makes pathways to ideas that never even existed. And it's amazing what comes along for the ride, you know? Oh yeah. You know what? I don't remember putting that in the hold, but I guess, uh, I guess that is part of the journey now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, on a general note, it seems that the it seems like the the stellar and perhaps uh, even the interstellar 
as a layer of the real has been beckoning to the human over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I felt increasingly drawn to work with the, the stellar layer of astrology and astrological magic. And it did thing it, it exposing myself to that radiation did some very interesting things. <laughs> Fair enough. So what, what does the, the stellar or the intergalactic mean in terms of astrology? Like, well, so on a really simple level, um, but very important level, the planets move and stars don't from our point of view, right? <clears throat> and certainly, um, you know, the, the planets are, they're racing around the sun and, you know, first they're against this stellar backdrop and now they're in line with that star. And, you know, that's, that's what planet means. Planet, uh, the, the Greek root for planet means wanderer. It's a wandering star as opposed to, to a fixed star. Um, and the planets are also, you know, quite literally subservient to the sun, um, to our star. You know, they are all once pieces of the same undifferentiated matter, and they, you know, they obey the sun in motion and are fed by its light, right? So we're dealing with, you know, something, you know, we're dealing with the children of stars rather than stars, yeah. Um, whereas each of the, you know, each of the stars whose light uh, reaches into our system, you know, is its own sovereign. It's its own parent, right? And there's really, if we're looking on a, just even on a physical level at like ranks of beings in the physical world, there's nothing really beyond stars. Maybe black holes. I don't know. You know, their 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 nature is still elusive. But like stars are the they're the, the, the biggest things. They're the biggest distinct beings or entities. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> so, you know, what's interesting is the, 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 the stars are considered, uh, if we look at the Picatrix, um, which is for people who aren't familiar with it, the, the big book of astrological magic, it's um, yeah. 11th century, originally written in Arabic, got translated and modified a little bit showed up in Latin a few centuries later and was, uh, has been tremendously um, influential. You know, so the Picatrix, when talking about the intersection between stellar and planetary, um, says that, you know, if you want something to, if you're doing working, right, and you want, um, you want the pattern that you're impressing into the world to be um, enduring and, you know, eternal, enduring, um, to not just be a quick change or you know a difference next month um, that you then align you, you align the power of a star and a planet you let the you let that star manifest through that planet you get the planet is like the the lens that brings it into our system but that star is going to provide a, a higher octane laser with which to etch a pattern into life um, Anyway, there's so much to talk about with stars. <laughs> not, 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 un, not, not dissimilar in some ways to approaching using a god to come through a planet or using, you know, you're lining up those other, other energies and then you're creating a bigger uh, vibration or power or possibility through them, right? Exactly. Well, and that's the, um, that's the you know, that's the, the art, the traditional astrological talismanic art is you have the planet, right? And <clears throat> that is, we can see that as one link on a chain of being, but you don't just, you don't just, you know, uh, you don't just heat up that planet. You have the words that you speak, the way that you're dressed, um, as well as the way that you speak should all be of the same nature. Mm-hmm. The na- your surroundings ideally should be of the same nature. The material that you're going to make the talisman of should be, should be another representation of the same nature at the level of stone, right? The incense should be made of planets that are of the same nature at the vegetative level, right? And, you know, you, you basically, when, when the art is perfect, um, everything at every point in the chain of being, um, you know, from the unnameable all the way down, you know, to the dirt beneath your feet should be exactly of, of one nature, and that's, you know, there's a huge difference experientially um, and uh, results wise when you bring every, every level to bear on imp- making, you know, impressing a change into reality. Mm-hmm. 
So, you know, whereas like you can get away with like, you know, not having the incense or just doing a paper talisman instead of stone and, you know, maybe having the planet like not in the best condition. Um, you can do things and, and stuff will happen, but it's when it's when you have, you know, the it's in a sense, you, it's the same reality on every level as far as you know, and it's all tuned to the same. Then you, you know, you get that, that pal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause I mean, necessity wins out and you have to do something on today for something tomorrow. Well, that's the end of the conversation. Just do right. the thing. Right. Well, and but what and what I would say that because um, I've, I've again I've been teaching this material for the first time, um, traditional astrological talismanic magic is absolutely not emergency magic. It's making oh, yeah. lasting, permanent, life-altering changes. It's it's like building, you know, it, uh, it, it's it's carving a it's literally carving a stone, um, and it's carving the stone of your life. It's building a temple. It's building the pyramids. It's big and lasting. And so, you know, you can actually um, fuck yourself up pretty good um, if you use that protocol when the elements aren't aligned very well, um, because you'll impress really deeply um, into, you know, into the talisman, a pattern that might be good enough for tomorrow, but you don't want to, you don't want to let that pattern um, colonize your life. I, you know, um, some of my sort of hardcore astro talismanic friends, all of us have um, uh, stories ranging from horrible to hilarious about when we thought this was good enough and made it anyway. And we knew we were wrong. Like a good friend of mine told me a story about how she made this fixed star talisman. And um, <clears throat> basically there are a lot of things that are good about this star, but if you look at the lore, there's this association with uh, wounded feet. Um okay. And then she picked a time where she picked a, a time to work that star where Mars was extremely prominent and configured to that to that star. And she got and she was wearing a talisman for a couple of weeks and all the good things that are associated with that talisman happen. And she fell down the stairs and couldn't walk properly for six months. Right. Right. Um, and that wasn't what she asked for. It's just that that's what that moment in time could provide. And if, you know, if she just did like sort of a more of a petition, like a quickie spell um, to that star and just got a little, you know, got, got enough juice to, you know, move that brick three, three feet over or to like have the energy to do, you know, uh, whatever labors were demanded over the next week, wouldn't have had that. But because with a, with a talis, uh, with the full on talismanic art, you're impressing that pattern really deeply. And you'll get the pieces of that moment in time that you didn't ask for, but are part of it anyway. You get the whole picture. Right? Yeah. And that's why, that's why the rules are so picky. Mm-hmm. And people are like, yeah, but what if I have to? Then don't do talisman. Don't do that style of talisman. Go, do a go planetary to, position. You yeah. can do that. That'll work. Go to the Picatrix and call somebody up and be like, hey, come and help me with this thing for a few minutes or whatever. Yeah, right? like, yeah exactly. Uh, I do, you know, I do micro planetary magic every day you know i'll heat up the altar and you know i've got little little informal planetary altars uh all around my office and house and so you know during my 10 minutes of just like checking in and you know tasting the brew um you know i'll do a little i might do a little thing to nudge something right because that's all i need and i don't need a lot of power to to nudge it Um, I, you know, I would, you don't need to go, you don't need to go full talisman for most things. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, I had, uh, Jason Miller on recently and we were talking about don't do emergency, like try not to let it till it gets to emergency magic level. Right. Yeah. That stuff always comes up, you know, at some point in our lives, but, uh, let's have relationships. Let's, let's be in the magic. Let's live the magic. Let's, be in the flow of the planets and work with that. And then, you know, hopefully move beyond that place where those things become required. And like you say, those little adjustments, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Always, always steering. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny that you bring Jason up because, um, so I, 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 I absolutely have to plug my book that's coming out, yeah, <laughs> which is, it, I say mine, but there are 11 other authors. I, I co-edited it. It feels like my baby. Um, but, you know, even a baby is not your possession, right? <laughs> yeah. um, 
although one do, does tend to be possessive. Um, so this is an anthology of essays <clears throat> um, about astrological magic. Uh, it's going to be it's being published by Three Hands Press. I co-edited it with um, Daniel Schulke. And it's got an essay by me on the fixed stars um, and Daniel on um, the planetary viscera of witchcraft, which is a wonderful meditation. Um, I had the pleasure of editing that recently. But Jason is also, um, Jason is also one of the contributors. And um, I brought Jason on um, for exactly what he delivered, which is a like, you know, okay, when the stars aren't right, what do you do? How can you maybe get something that looks Venusian from Mars? How do you, you know, it's that practical, you know, getting into it. I brought him on for the nuances of the nuances of practice and how when the better you understand the planets, the more you can do with any one sphere. Uh, he gave a great example of how there was a, a person who's having trouble with their love life um, and the, all the Venus work in the world wasn't really changing things. Um, but when, um, when Mars got brought on and the, the focal point was uh, the courage um, to face rejection and the, you know, the, the, the willingness to assert oneself, um, then everything clicked in. Right, and so we can say relationships are Venusian, and that's true. But if when we're trying to untangle a particular knot, sometimes you know, in that case, it was Mars that needed to be tugged on, not Venus. Sure. Yeah. And then, uh, so you know, what I tried to do w with the contributors that I invited was to provide both a historical overview and. Um, also to get people to articulate the traditional principles. Um, and there are several authors who did that really well. And then I also wanted, uh, I'd say the other half are about working with that material and what you discover in practice and what are maybe other ways of looking at things. What are, um, how should we say, what are details of practice that are not covered in thousand year old books? What comes up along the way? Um, and so, I, I believe at this point that we did a really nice job of um, sort of bridging the, the present, past, and future, but that will be up to the reader to decide. Awesome. So that's well, called that's the... the this, it. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, it took a long time, so I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm rather looking forward to its publication. It should be out in May, and it is called The Celestial Art. Celestial Art, lovely. Well, maybe this is a good point to... I think that I could spend all day talking with you about these things, but uh, maybe we should wrap this up here for now. And um, why don't you tell people where they should come and hang out with you? We okay. have a great newsletter and, and stuff like that. So yeah, where are you? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm at my name.com. I'm at Austin com. That's a U S T I N C O P P O C K.com. And um, I offer online classes um, both live and um, as well as the library of past material. Um, I write on a, not a weekly, but a decanly basis. Um, I wrote a book on the, the decans or the division of sky and time into 36. And um, I've started doing my, my astrological column on that pattern um, rather than the weekly as an experiment. And I also write a short paragraph about every day's astrology, just a little bit like, okay, here's what's, you know, here's what's in the air uh, at a given time. And so, yeah, um, you'll be able to find all my stuff there. I'm on, uh, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter. Um, I didn't quite make it onto Instagram or anything that came after Twitter. I'm, I'm at that age where I'd, I'd adapted enough and began to ossify and dry out and wither. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can't do any more of this. Yeah, another right. one. There's, there's another uh, astrological endeavor, right? Which, uh, which signs and or placements give people predilection for one platform over another. Because oh, I think Instagram is the uh, pinnacle of social media and the best thing ever. So that I, Well, what I was going to say is that um, it's totally, the, we can say it's definitely fiery. Right. It's not as textual. It's more image based. It's a little bit yeah. more dynamic. And, 
Yeah. So, and you said you were, uh, this, your sun was in Sagittarius and Mars and Aries. Yeah. That's a great start for fire. <laughs> That's for sure. if nothing else is in fire, then you are, um, more than sufficiently inflamed. Oh, my, my ascendant is in Leo and, uh, yeah, I got a bunch of pile of stuff in Sagittarius. So yeah. Okay. I, I got, I got lots of fire. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm, well, um, I'm, I'm more water than anything else. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I don't, yeah, Instagram seems a little, little loud for me, mm. <laughs> visually and otherwise. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Well, thank you so much for making the time today, Austin. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, it has. Appreciate it. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Thank you, as always, for listening. Please do us a solid here. Help spread the word. Share this on whatever social media you're into. Swing by iTunes and give us a hopefully five-star review or whatever you feel uh, because those things help this podcast be found. They help spread the word uh, and they help make this more sustainable for me because this is definitely one of those projects where the more the merrier. And also drop me a line and let me know what you think. I'm considering starting uh, maybe a Facebook group or something like that to uh, continue these conversations a little further beyond just the podcast itself. So, you know, fire something off to me on social media or drop me a line uh, by my email uh, or through the website at thehermitslamp.com. And uh, let me know if that's something you'd be inspired by. Talk to you soon.